series about Bible prophecy. The truth about it is all scripture is basically prophetic from the start to the end. It's, it's, prophecy is not some mysticism. Prophecy is just what God's telling you going to happen through the ages, okay? And, uh, and, and prophecy ought to make you glad, not scared, unless you're lost. If you're lost, you ought to be scared. If you're saved, you ought to be glad. And, uh, but we, last time we looked at the general overview of prophecy. And we talked about the regathering of Israel. And uh, you want to read Romans 9, 10, 11 about that. But Israel, the Jewish people being regathered from countries all over the world, coming back in Israel, becoming a nation again after 2,000 years. And we're seeing these Old Testament prophecies concerning the people of the, the Jewish nation, literally in, in our lifetime, in our generation, seeing them come back into land and so forth and become a preeminent nation. world. Now, the next thing that's happening on, this, on, the, uh, uh, on the calendar of God is the taking out of the church. And uh, it's called, some people call it the rapture. That word's not in the Bible, but that's the next thing on the agenda after we get into Israel. Then the, great, the tribulation period starts, which is in two different parts. There's two, three and a half year periods. <laughs> the Azai Christ will come up and make an agreement with Israel. He'll break that covenant in the halfway point of that tribulation. And he'll turn on Israel. And that is, the last three and a half years is what's called the great tribulation. That's what Jesus called the great tribulation. It's during that time that you'll see the rise of the Antichrist. And, his, and, the, and the real blossoming of, of his false church, and this is where I'm headed this morning, uh, you'll see the wrath of God poured out upon this earth as never before. Jesus said, never has been, never will be again, like he'll be poured out that time. At the end of that, you'll see the battle of Armageddon and the return in, uh, to the earth of the Lord Jesus Christ in power and glory. The second coming of Jesus Christ is in two phases. He comes first for the church. We meet him in the air. Seven years later, he comes back with the church to rule and reign. His feet will touch Mount Olives. It'll split. There'll be a fountain coming out of that, and it'll cleanse the the Dead Sea. Amazing stuff. And that's all back in the Old Testament prophecy of the Millennial Kingdom, all right? And so, after that return to Christ, the Millennial Kingdom starts a thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ on this earth. Satan will be bound, the Bible said in Revelation chapter 20, during that time. At the end of that period, thousand-year period... Now, Satan will be loosed, and for a little season, he will gather a rebellion against God on this earth. And then fire will come down out of heaven, the Bible said, and destroy him. And Satan, in chapter 20 of Revelation, verse number 10, will be cast into the lake of fire forever and ever. And that's the end of the deal for him. And then after that's the great white throne judgment. And then after the great white throne judgment is the new heaven and the new earth and eternity, the everlasting kingdom of Jesus Christ. That's, your, that's a brief review of what we did here a couple of weeks ago. But before any of this happens, there's something I want to talk to this church about, and I'm very heavily burdened about this, but I, I, I say this for the sake of Elijah, I say it for the sake of you, for uh, uh, um, Sid. I started to call you Skid. I knew that wasn't right. I don't know what's wrong with me, Dick King. <laughs> ice cream, ice cream. Another Andy's right there. And, uh, okay. <laughs> wow. I say that for you kids, because these kids going up to this church are going to see something you and I have not seen. And what they're getting ready to enter into is what the Bible calls pre, just, you know, really, that'll really accelerate before the coming of Jesus Christ is a word I'm going to give you. It's called apostasy. Apostasy. Now, the word apostasy, I do not believe is in the Bible, but the doctrine is. Kind of like the word rapture, not in the Bible, but the doctrine is. Apostasy is what we call, the Bible call about a great falling away. In that verse, it says in chapter 2, 1 Timothy 4, verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, so it tells you when, some shall depart from the faith. Apostasy is a departure from the faith. All right? And uh, this is, has been burdened me. Uh, in the, we call it apostasy. We call it, uh, some people call it the great falling away. The Bible speaks of this falling away from the faith. Brother Jeremy, bless your heart. I guess you want to Andy's too, right? <laughs> You've been growling a little bit. Okay, thank you. I sure appreciate it, brother. Thank you so much. The Bible here calls it a departure from the faith. Why is it important to you and I this morning, this issue of apostasy? I don't like to talk about it. I don't like to see it. It grieves me in one side to see it, and, and it's happening in front of our eyes. It has accelerated uh, from the, about 1980, uh, actually from the end of World War II. If you don't, that's when it really started accelerating apostasy in this nation. 
It's interesting right now, if you'll read Christian, I'm talking about solid Christian Bible-believing men from other nations, England, China, Japan, anywhere you want to go across South Africa, there are Christians who are writing about America. They're standing over here in another nation, and they've made it, America is a great study to these people, and, and, and they're looking at us, and they are in standing in marvel of the apostasy and how fast the falling away is occurring in America. Why is it important to you? Because your children need to know and be aware of this issue called apostasy, or they'll be swept into it. Ray Comfort says, I don't know where he gets the statistics from, that 88% of American Christian churches right now, of their youth, after the age of 18, are leaving the church forever. Never come back. That means 12, only 12% of the average church's young people are going to be in church next 20 years. And I'm telling you something. If I've got one thing I want to see happen in this church, I don't want that to happen. I at least want it flipped. I only want about... I don't even want any, but I'd rather see 12% not coming back in than 88% not coming in. I think we ought to have 88% staying and not 88% going. It's important because these kids are going to be faced with it and are faced with it. It is preparatory for the harlot church to come in. Now listen to me carefully. There's a Christ and he has a true church. Church of the firstborn. Born again believers of the Spirit of God. People who have repented of their sin and placed their faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I don't care what your name tag is. I'm not interested in that. If you've been born again of the Spirit of God and saved by the grace of God, you place your faith and trust not in your self-righteousness or in your works, but you place your faith and trust in the shed blood of Jesus Christ that He died for you on that cross, was buried and rose again. You play, That's what you're hank- anchoring your soul on. I'll tell you something. God saved you. Amen. God saved you on that basis. But if you're not, now, the Bible teaches Christ, there's Christ and His church. Satan is an imitator. The Antichrist has a church. The Bible calls it the great harlot. Okay? And Revelation 17 describes it to a T. What you are living in today is, this time of apostasy is the preparation of the harlot church for the coming Antichrist. And I'm telling you something. It's amazing to me how God, when He wants a message preached, causes events and things you to see. This week I drove by a church that I have known many people who've attended there. Men who, like Donnie said earlier, sacrificed to see that place built. Men who stood for something. And I saw on that church this week a sign that said, Announcing New Contemporary Services. Contemporary service, I believe, 8 or 8.30 in the morning. And then they had over a traditional service at 11 or 10.30, whatever it was. And I want to bring that in just a minute and show you how apostasy is sweeping, not just in some big city, it's sweeping through our rural areas right now. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter, or go to 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 3. The Bible said, for the time will come. When they will not endure sound doctrine, young people, you're going to be leading this church. You know something, I'm, I'm 59 years old, I may not live till the sun goes down tonight. But if I live to be 90, somebody's going to take over here someday. And I'm telling you something, I want God to burn this place down before, he turns it, before it goes into an apostate church. I want a tornado to blow this thing, I, I want to blow this whole building off this land before I see this place go to apostasy. And, I, and, you know, and also, I'm going to tell you something else I want. I want a pastor to come into this pulpit out of this church. I don't want him coming from someplace else. Hey, plenty of you, you, you boys, you young men in here could pastor this church. God calls you. And I'll tell you something. You know the heart of this place, and you know these people, and you know the burden. And you know the, the work that's been done. The Bible said, the times come, they'll not endure sound doctrine. Did you know most people in churches don't want to have doctrine preached? And preachers are now bragging that we don't emphasize doctrine here. We just, we just came to worship God. That, that church is already into apostasy. The time will come they'll not endure a sound doctrine, but after their own lust. In other words, they want preachers and teachers to tell them what they want to hear, what their flesh wants to hear. Shall heap to themselves, teachers having each and ears. I hate to say, but most of your Christian radio stuff is exactly that. Is exactly that. Just heaping up stuff folks want to hear. Verse number four, and they shall turn away. There it is. There's this apostasy. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. 
That is describing the apostasy that is going to come. In 2 Thessalonians, just turn over, turn back uh, just a couple of three pages there. Turn back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse number 3. Here it is. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. There it is. Underline that. A falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. The falling away comes, and here comes a man of sin. That's what I've been trying to get across. You're living in the day preparatory to the apostate church. And I'm telling you, the apostate church is taking over mainline, what people call Bible-believing churches in America right now. You need to understand that the church age, it means to desert and depart from the faith, to abandon the truth of faith. And we need to understand that Satan imitates everything about God, and his main ability is to deceive people. Satan as it has an imitation or a false church. In church history, the last 2,000 years, you've had two streams of Christendom. Christendom is different than Christianity. Christendom is when everything wants to be called Christian, but it's not really Christian. Mormon church, Jehovah Witness church, all that kind of junk, all these things, that, all that, they're in Christendom, but they're not Christian. So you've had two streams of Christendom. You've had the true church, those who repent have been born again, but you've had a false church that's full of man-made traditions, And it may start out biblical, but over a few generations, they get away from the Bible and they start actually preaching their denominational lines. They preach safe denominational preaching rather than what the Bible says. The group or the uh, 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 the denomination, the church's teachings then eventually assume authority over anything the Bible says. That's what we believe. We don't care what the Bible says. And instead of dealing with it, what they'll do, they'll never preach on things that don't fit. They'll jump. The passages of Scripture don't fit. I want to tell you something. Any preacher won't preach the full counsel, the whole counsel of God. Let me tell you something. If he's afraid to preach any passage, he's got a problem. Now, you may not understand the passage, but you ought to at least expose the congregation to it. You ought to have enough grace and humility to say, you know, folks, I don't understand all about this, but this is what the Word of God says. Here it is. Let the Holy Spirit do with it what He wants to But they'll put their group teachings as authority over the Bible. And they'll misuse Scripture, and they'll rest Scripture and twist Scripture to prove or promote their lives. And mostly it's what they will not put out. Now I want you to go to Matthew chapter 24. Now, if you're interested in this study, in this series of prophecy, you need to understand this. Matthew chapter 24 is the key prophetic passage of Scripture... That Jesus Christ taught, and watch this now, hang on. Every other prophetic thing said in the rest of the New Testament comes off of Matthew 24. And it must match Matthew 24, or it's wrong. Jesus laid this foundation prophecy passage, and all the other prophetic passages need to tie in with it. But i just give you two or three verses. Now, I'm going to preach here in two or three weeks. Explicitly on this chapter. Whoa, we're going to have a good time. Matthew 24. More fights and arguments over it. There is anything in the world. But, verse number 4, look what Jesus said. Verse number 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. He's talking about apostasy. Look at verse number 11. And many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. Look at verse number 24. There shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch. As if it were possible to deceive the very elect. He didn't say it was possible, but he said, as it were possible, he said, this is going to get wild. He said, it's going, he said, if you're not saved, you're going to get thought, you're going to get in this trap. I want you to go to Acts chapter 20 and see what the apostle Paul said about this. Acts chapter 20, verse number 27. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. To feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For this, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Watch verse 30. Also, now it takes a tough person to believe this one. Of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, and draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch and remember, that by the space of three years I cease not to warm everyone at night and day with tears. Paul's warning them about apostasy. 
Now, uh, in Matthew chapter 13, don't turn there, but it's the great chapter on the parables of the kingdom. In that chapter, did not Jesus Christ teach us that there would be tares among the wheat, that there would be leaven in the meal? Now, I'm going to preach a message on leaven in the meal. But leaven in the meal is what's going on right now in this nation. That prophecy of Jesus' in Matthew 13 is literally happening in America today in the churches. Leaven is always a picture of sin, and it's particularly false doctrine. And leaven, by the way, when Jesus said three meals, you're talking about Catholicism, the Greek Orthodox Church, and Protestantism. Those are the three meals which the leaven is going to be put into, okay? Now, this goes along with the spirit of Antichrist in 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. And I want to just get this and we're going to go home. Number one, the areas where churches have become apostate in America. Number one, they have become apostate by departing from the fundamental tenets of the Christian faith, such as, number one, Many do not believe any longer in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the Bible clearly teaches, was born of a virgin. If he was not born of a virgin, he is not God. And that's why they attacked the virgin birth. You check it out at your, your group's college. You check it out with your group's denominational headquarters. Do they unequivocally believe that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin? If boys, let's do me. Any group, any organization that quivers or falters in this area, you leave them immediately. Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. He cannot be God unless he was born of the Holy Ghost of God in the womb of a virgin. Not only that, but they do not believe oftentimes they've departed from the bodily resurrection. They think, they said it's a spirit. They don't believe in the bodily resurrection. They don't believe in the virgin birth. They don't believe in blood atonement. You would be shocked. At men, some of you think are great preachers, who do not believe in the blood atonement, do not believe in the necessity of the blood. Right now, there's an apostate doctrine going around that it's just the death of Jesus Christ that saves, not His blood. That's not true. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. I want to tell you something. God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. You boys listen to me. Any church that takes out the virgin birth, takes out the blood atonement, takes out the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, the sinless life of Jesus Christ, they're an apostate church already. Get away from them and stay out of them. I'll tell you something else. Any church that does not teach salvation by grace alone is an apostate church, and I don't care if they've been running for 500 years. We're not saved by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He has saved us. I'm not preaching to be saved, and you coming to church here this morning ain't going to get you brownie points to get into heaven. You're saved by the substitutionary, sacrificial death of Jesus Christ, and there's no meaner, sorry, or low-down person in the world than somebody that believes that Jesus died for me, but it's how good I live to get there. You're a liar. You don't know the gospel. And you're dangerous to everybody else's salvation. Let me tell you something. If it's how good you are, then tell me, pray, why did Jesus die? And if His blood and His death is not sufficient to take you to heaven, brother, don't tell me your filthy rag righteousness is good enough. And so they, they depart from the fundamentals of the faith. They get to where they don't believe in heaven or hell. It's amazing to me how many of them don't believe in hell, but they still believe in heaven. The second area where churches have become apostate is in the Bible. I'll tell you right now, we get letter after letter, email after email, letter after letter, phone call after phone call. We can't find a church in our town that preaches out of the authorized version. Any church that has left the King James Bible is an apostate church. They're apostate. They've departed from the faith. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing comes by the Word of God. You depart from this Bible, you've departed from the faith. I was talking to one of my sons yesterday, a man that I admire and respect and been a great blessing in my life. He now believes that the Greek and Hebrew has equal authority with the King James Bible. That's not true. Some of you say, whoa, Reggie, now you're stepping on people's toes right there. I'll be glad to step on them. I don't know, in fact, I'm not even trying to step on your toes. I'm trying to get to your heart. Because here's why I'm going to tell you something. If the, if the Greek and the Hebrew is an authority over this Bible, then God didn't preserve His Word. That's number one. 
But let me tell you this. You know what they do all the time? They're arguing over what the Greek and the Hebrew word means. I asked the man this question. I said, all right, let's say that you take that as an equal authority. First of all, why don't you preach out of the Greek and why don't you preach out of Hebrew because if you really think it's the Word of God? Because nobody would understand what you're saying. The truth about it is it's the doctrine of Nicolaitine. They want to get up here and tell you that in the Greek it says this and in the Hebrew it says this to make them sound real smart intellectual like you're a dumb idiot. You can't understand the Bible. You need me. That's the doctrine of conquering the laity. Nicolaitine means to conquer the laity. It means that you ain't got enough sense to read the Bible and understand it and that, and that can control your souls. That's exactly right. It's called soul slavery. Roman Catholic Church has been doing it for centuries. But Protestant churches have been doing it too. Let me say something to you. What are you going to get in? You say you believe the Greek and the Hebrew has equal authority. All right. What are you going to do when somebody disagrees with you about what that Greek word meant? What are you going to do when you find out that that four or five different theologians have different definitions to the same word? Then what are you going to do? Who's going to decide what the word really means then? Can I tell you something? I ain't nothing but a stupid hillbilly. But I got enough sense to know God don't talk out both sides of his mouth. And I will tell you, I do believe God has preserved his word in the Greek and Hebrew, but I don't know where it's at. And there are no original manuscripts. There's not one in the world. I'll give you a million dollars if I have to go borrow it. You can find me one original manuscript. I'll give you five million. You can't find it. It's not there. When they tell you original manuscripts, they're lying straight out of their teeth. And you boys listen to me. I'm going to leave you with this. If I die this week, I want you to remember something. Don't you go apostate. You stay with this King James Bible. You stay with this authorized version. A church that leaves it is apostate. They're saying God talks out of both sides of his mouth. And every time you'll see the power leave that church. And then what happens when the power leaves the church? They're aware of it, so they have to start bringing in false power. Then comes the next issue. Anybody tell me what the next one is? Music, you're right. Before I go to that, let me say what they do with the Bible. They'll abandon it. I mean, it's amazing to me. I've had Methodist preachers tell me that they get sent their messages every week from headquarters. The outline is sent to them. I don't, I don't, I'm sure they don't all do that. But I'd hate to think that I was waiting on headquarters to send me my message this week. No wonder they sit around the coffee shop so much and eat donuts. No wonder there's no power. Any preacher that puts the Greek and Hebrew in authority over this Bible, don't listen to him. Get away from him. They'll rewrite it. They'll revise it. And then they question it like Satan did Eve. They'll scoff it and scorn it. They'll put their intellect above it. They'll subject the Bible to their little penny any minds. They'll outright deny it or reject it. They reject inspiration. And I want to tell you something. You get this down. You can read the doctrinal statements of churches, mission groups all over this country. I dare you to do this this afternoon. Go to their websites. Read their doctrinal statements concerning the Bible. They'll always say we believe in the inspired Word of God. Well, we believe the Bible is the Word of God. But they will not say we believe in the doctrine of the preservation of God's Word. The Bible said in Psalms chapter 12, He has preserved His Word forever. If He preserved His Word, where is it at? Right here. This is the Bible God has used to evangelize this world. This is the Bible He's still using. The big issue, though, is this. Somebody says, Reggie, changing words and phrases and changing verses really isn't that important. Oh, I'm going to ask you a question then. Have you got a will? Have you got a will? All right, let me borrow that will for a couple of days. I'm just going to change a word or two in it. I won't make many changes, just a little bit. If this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard tell of in my life. Preachers are getting up and casting doubt on the Word of God, acting like God doesn't know what He said. And it's okay for them to change it and to, re- and to redefine all the words. But they sure wouldn't want you taking their will and taking a few words out of it. They know words are important. Words have meaning and words are specific and you don't mess with them. But it's okay to do it to God's Word. i got to roll. Get you out of here. The next thing is in the doctrine of preaching. Instead of preaching anymore, we're sharing. I'm not against sharing. But God said through the foolishness of preaching that men would be saved. I'm going to tell you something. I've had preacher after preacher over the last 30 years tell me, Reggie, when I went to Bible college, 
I was on fire for God. I had a burden. I had a vision. By the time I come out, I didn't have nothing. How many of you ever heard of Mike Hoggard? Mike Hoggard will tell you he went into that college believing the Bible, came out of that college not believing the Bible. I was told by Bible college professors, it is not true, it is not accurate. I'm going to tell you something. Instead of telling sinners they need to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we're trying to make them feel good. We're trying to slick them in and just be, be, you know, hey, it's good to be friendly. We ought to be friendly. We ought to be loving. We ought to be kind. We ought to be compassionate. But you cannot convince me of your compassion if you will not tell a man he's lost and on the road to hell. You tell me you're compassionate and you never will tell that man he needs to be born again in the Spirit of God. You are deceived yourself. You do not know the truth. You're a, you're a, da- you're a danger to that person's soul. I'll go further and say that for us parents to claim that we love the Lord and we love our kids and to never warn our own kids of the danger of hell, fire, and brimstone. And we claim to love them. Can you imagine standing at the day of judgment and your own children looking at you and saying, Daddy, Daddy, why didn't you tell me? Daddy, why didn't you warn me? Why didn't you grab me by the shoulder and say, Son, you need to be saved. And we claim to love people. Number three in separation and fellowship is apostasy. I mean, it's amazing. I'll go back to this thing. It's amazing how many people I've seen or heard their testimony that I went to church for 30 years and they never once said we had to be born again. I never knew it. Nobody ever said you must be born again. I sat there for years. I grew up in it. This week, uh, the testimony of a Lutheran man grew up in a Lutheran church. He said, I never one time in my life knew that you needed to be saved. He said, I went through their catechism, I went through this, and I went through all the things. And he said, you know, just hoping I'd make it in the end. Until one day, a gracious man told me, he said, have you ever been born again? He said, I don't know what that is. What are you talking about? And he said, he explained to me about that. He said, that's when God planted the seed in my heart. That was the need. Thirdly, in separation and fellowship. We're living in a time of ecumenicalism where it's all right to yoke up with cults and false religions right and left. In our separation of fellowship and conduct, it's worldly. I'll tell you, I never will forget years ago, I was preaching at a, and I know, I know people like that. No, you listen to me. And for those of you listening on CD, I don't hate nobody and I ain't against nobody. But the truth's the truth. And so I'm not attacking anybody, I'm not jumping on me. But, and I've got good friends, and I want to tell you something. I believe there's some saved people about anywhere you want to go, but I, there, I, believe, I believe there's some bad things wrong with a lot of our church, church entity today. I remember when I got called to go preach to Assembly of God Church, and when I was growing up a boy, I want to tell you, Assembly of God churches were known for holiness, dressing right, uh, being separated from the world. How many knows what I'm talking about? And I'll tell you what, I was invited to preach to Assembly of God Church, the revival meeting. Sweet people, nice people. But I tell you, every night I get up behind the pulpit, I'm not joking, this is back in the 80s. There's women in there, their they're tops would be, you'd see the cleavage, you're sitting there preaching, and all you can see is the edges of their breasts. They're getting up and singing specials and slits in their, brow, in their, in their dresses. I mean, they got every kind of color sprayed on. And I'm sitting there thinking, this is not the assembly of God people that I knew growing up. What has happened to these people? And you walk in the average charismatic church today, and I'll tell you what, it's as worldly in their dress and I know some of you don't like that, but I'm going to tell you something. Modesty is still in the Bible. And it's always going to be able because he's preserved it. And you're listening to me today. This apostasy is sweeping into our churches. And it comes little by little. We think it's all right. Well, you know, uh, Mama, Dad, Mama, she may believe in dressing that way, but I don't think so. Daddy may believe in dressing that way, but I don't think so. I'm going to tell you, that's how your churches get stolen out from you. Our activities and our entertainments and our pleasures. I want to tell you something. There's some movies God's people ought not be watching. There's some music we ought not be listening to. And I want to tell you something further. That the immorality that has invaded our churches is beyond belief today. And it's just that we've compromised. We're, we're, our separation is over. Our, our convictions. And then I, I want to go to this thing in music. Let me tell you. The next thing that comes into an apostate church after the Bible's gone out is apostate music. You listen to me, I was up there here a while back in Springfield to the hospital with Dean when, uh, I believe, Jake, when your boy was born. I was sitting in the waiting room of that hospital and an advertisement for James River Assembly Church come on. And I'm telling you what, it was, it was, it looked like a rock concert. 
And there's fog in the air, and here's the, 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 the big auditorium up here, and the band's up there, and they're doing this and with, with their guitars running across like this, and they're bum, 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 like that, and the kids are just doing this out in front of the stage, and they're all up out of their chairs up here in the front doing that. And Dean, did I not say, what is that? Yeah. Dean said, that's James River Assembly Worship System. Now, you listen to me good. That is out of hell fire. That is out of hell itself, and I don't care what they write on their name. They're in the wrong about that. James River Assembly people, I love you. You need to repent of your sin. You need to get that hellish rock and roll out of your church. You need to teach them kids there's a difference in music. You need to teach them that the devil was the one who had built in tablets, that his specialty is music, and he's led more people to hell through music than you can shake a stick at. Now, I'm going to tell you something right now. I was a sinner saved by grace. I've been to rock concerts. I know, what, and I'm not proud of it, but I'll tell you one thing. The only good come out of it, I can spot it, buddy. Yeah. I've been to Eagle concerts when you couldn't see nothing but the smoke of the marijuana. Yeah. They shut off the lights. There was nothing but cigarette. But you can see the cigarettes lit all over the deal. Let me tell you, rock and roll people, know they know what that stuff is. But here's what's really happened. you got a bunch of false converted people that was in rock and roll, and they love their rock and roll because they're, they're addicted to it and controlled by, by the devil. And they're bringing it into these churches. And so when the old preachers moved off, they come in, you know, going to have a new music director. And so we're going to get the teens. We're going to have a, you know, by the way, you know what? Our youth group is your family. You know who your youth pastor is in this church? It's your daddy. That's who your youth pastor is. I'm the pastor. All the youth pastors are your daddies. You say, I wish we had a youth pastor. You got one. And then your, and then your next youth pastor is your grandpa. You go to your grandpa and you go to your daddy. That'd be all the youth pastor you need, amen. But they've got these youth ministers coming in, these youth pastors. They're going to go off over here and have a deal with the kids so they can get away from mom and daddy and introduce them to a bunch of junk. They're going to kumbaya and kumbaya. You listen to me? The second a church lets that garbage in, that church is going to apostate. It's sensual, it's fleshly, it's of the devil. And some of you kids have got all that contemporary junk in your trucks and your cars, and you swoon going down the road because, you know, you kind of feel not too bad because this has got nice words to it. But you really kind of like your flesh because it's got that whoopy whoopy, lovey dovey, almost like Michael Jackson stuff. And the truth be known about you, that's where you really want to be at. Because your heart's not right. Somebody needs to love you enough to tell you. But I'll tell you what I'm telling you this morning. It breaks my heart to see these old time. I'm going to tell you what, all over this country, we've got old time churches that are leaving this thing. They left the Bible. They've left the music. Now, they, you know, hey, I want to ask you a question, Frankie. What in the world would we want an 830 contemporary service here for? And then why would we want 11 o'clock traditional service? You know why we want that? Because there's a split in the church. We want that because we've got a bunch of young people that's wanting to have the devil and the flesh and the world in the church, but the old folks ain't going for it. And so now we're pulling the stupidest thing we could ever do, Donnie, with your Sunday school class. Now we've got the kids worshiping all among themselves, throwing off what mom and dad and grandpa, they're not even in church with mom and dad now. And I don't, I'm just going to tell you, it's wrong. It's wrong. I, I'm like, well, so we're having two different kind of services here now at this church, huh? And by the way, what's it, what's it mean to say contemporary? Modern. Yeah. Worldly. Yeah. <laughs> We've seen apostasy in the silence of our pulpits. Let me tell you something. I dare you. Our public schools have become the modern day temples of Baal. Where every truth in this Bible is being blasphemed. From the first page in Genesis to the book of Revelation. And our kids are being subjected to it. Now I want to ask you a question. How many preachers have preached against it? Almost none. We've got preachers that have been intimidated down by the fear of man because there's teachers and principals, superintendents, board members, bus drivers, cooks. Teachers, aides, and assistants sitting in a congregation. And, and it's their money. And you listen to this preacher. You want to tell how these churches are going to apostate? Because the preacher remains silent. Then the stuff from the school begins to take over what's inside the church. 
and move, move one generation up. And they're bringing all that garbage inside the church house now. And preachers are afraid to stand against it. So the, the, the sin of their silence is giving consent. The fear of man bringeth a snare. I'm begging you this morning, kids. I don't know when the old ones will pass off all of us. Don't you go apostate because that's what's coming. I told, I told one of my sons yesterday. I said, there were grandpas in that church who would throw that bunch out tomorrow morning for what they're going to do inside that auditorium. They would have thrown them out of that church house. How's apostasy spread? Like I said, by a little leaven. The Bible said a woman, not a virgin, talking about the false church, puts leaven into that meal. We read those passages of scriptures about false teachers and false prophets entering in their woods and sheep's clothing. Here's how it happens. A boy surrenders to preach. He goes to Bible college. Now, I'm going to give you some advice. You've been, if you've been called to preach, I, I'm... And I know I'm not, you don't have to get ruined at a Bible college. You don't have to. I'm telling you right now, you can stand along where you get. You can go and you can go and do right. But I will tell you this. You don't have, you can get a Bible education at home now. Yeah. By the way, I'm not sure that you need a lot of stuff that's being taught for pastors. Let me tell you something. You love God and love your neighbor. Love this book. Pour your heart out to people. You don't have to be a good speaker. You just need to tell people how, you know, and just preach this book and just start through a book and preach through it. You'd be amazed what God will do. But here's how it happens. They'll go, to, they'll go into Bible college, and they'll start getting all this stuff down, you know, this doubts dropped in their mind. Then they get into seminary, that's where they hit them. Because seminary is a closed circuit. And seminary is when they really tell them the Bible's full of mistakes and you can't preach. It's not got, and so here's what happened. These preachers, now here's what's happened in denominations across the country. The new crop of preachers comes out. The old preacher steps out. new preacher steps in. And what the first thing he does, he's been taught to do this. He pulses the congregation. How much resistance will there be to the apostasy? How many men have we got in here that will stand by the book? And he pulses that. And to the degree, now watch me, to the degree of the resistance is how slow he moves. And over time, see, they just keep dropping in, dropping in, and they start separating. And pretty soon, they'll make the old timers feel like that they're not even wanted there anymore. Or I'm not sitting here and listening to this stuff. And he finds out that maybe there's just two or three people or maybe two or three families left in the church who hasn't. Because you know what? People are pretty bad. They say, well, you know, we, we, this new preacher, he's not hurting anything. He's a nice guy. And he came to see, he came to see Susie when she was sick at the hospital. And, and he come over when grandma wasn't feeling good and he had prayer with her. And he's a nice guy. Can I tell you something? Listen to me. Catholic nuns and Catholic priests will come to you while you're at the hospital up there, and they'll take your hand and pat your hand and just talk. Just sweet. They'll be so sweet to you. They don't know nothing about going to heaven. Yeah. Patting you on the hand and visiting the sick does not make somebody true. In fact, you want to watch out that they're not covering their, their lack of doctrinal truth by their sweetness. They've got to cover it somehow or another. And so what happens is he comes in and he finally figures out, but you know, here's the tragedy. And here's what I want to get across for you. People are more apt to just set and let it go and accept it than they are to fight it. And that's amazing to me. It's unbelievable. I mean, there are people sitting in churches who grew up and they knew better. Now, let me say something to you. I've talked about others. Independent fundamental Baptist churches, they were started to go back. They came out of the Southern Baptist churches. There's a lot of good Southern Baptist churches. There really are. There's a lot of them that are just apostate as they can be. It's just dependent on what church you're in, what pastor's leading. But the independents used to pride themselves in the fact that they were not going to abandon the King James Bible and they were going to stay with these standards. And you know what you got now? It's getting hard to find an independent Baptist church that hadn't went to contemporary music, NIV, and just throwed everything out the door. How did that happen? Let me tell you how it happens. A pastor wants to see results. Are you listening to me? He wants results. Now, here's, here's, here's why you kids need to be careful. Elijah, you're going to get an invite from some little old sweetie thing. You know, she's going to look neat and pretty, and you kind of like her. You're going to get an invite to go with her to the, uh, her church is going on a trip to see a, uh, this gospel group. Whiz bangs. <laughs> the gospel whiz bangs. And you're going to go up there to the gospel whiz. You're going to go with her, and you're all excited, you know. And, you, and here's the deal. What's this? What's this? You want, to, you want to make her like you. That's the whole trick. Right? Right. Okay. Thank you. You're a boy. You've got it figured out. All right. <laughs> 
And in doing that, you're not going to go, this is all out of hell. I'm leaving. That's exactly how they get you. Can I tell you how these fundamental Bible-believing churches have been swept down in apostasy? Other kids invite their kids to go to this, and here's what they see. I've seen it. I've heard it. I've had it, I've had it flared at me right in my face. Well, there was people getting saved all over the place, and I, I never felt anything like it. I mean, there was just this ooh in the air, and, 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 and people were just falling down here, and, and there were people getting saved over here. And, oh, it was the most wonderful thing. And they were rocking and rolling, and you can't believe the power of God that was on that place. There's a power there, all right. But it's a false power. That's why when Jesus talks about apostasy, he's talking about deception. Every time he talks about it, every time he's written, he says, deceive, 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 deceive. Right? But you see what will happen. And if he's not careful, he will come back and he'll get in Sunday school down there. He'll get in the teen Sunday school class and he'll say, and Van's not down there. He'll say, man, you should have been with us Saturday night. Man, we went for the James River Assembly. Now, you never saw the power of God, man. People were falling on the floor and falling everywhere. And they were doing all this stuff. And man, you, and I just, it just, it just got to be of God. And this brings me to my next area of apostasy to see when they put experience over the Word of God. Well, I don't care what it said. I felt it. I can stick you with a needle and say, I ain't doing that. Well, I felt it. The just shall live by faith. And yes, you will feel a power. And you're going to have to be discerning enough to know whether it's of God or not. That's why the Bible wrote, that's why the Bible, that's why God wrote you all that stuff. I mean, they'll put, they'll, they'll, they'll spread it by bringing these preachers in and by, by having kids come over and do this, that, and the other. I want to get you out of here. The new way seems often as liberating to young people. This is why I'm specifically saying this to you. Know, here's why. Well, I come up here and read you, it's just negative, negative, negative. Don't do this and don't do that. I'm going to give you something. That's not true. First of all, that's not true. If it is, you're just coming on the right particular Sundays. Because I preach every once in a while happy messages, camp meeting messages, positive messages. But I'm going to give you a great truth in life. How many of you kids would like to drive? Like to have a car and drive someday? Raise your hand. All right. Y'all will walk? Horses? What are you looking for? Y- y'all want to drive. How many anybody would like to drive in here? There's a bunch of cars out there in the parking lot. Can I tell you something? Get this down. This is a great theological truth. You are not driving that car home unless it has on its battery both a positive and a negative. That's right. And any preacher that doesn't preach both positive and negative, there's no power in it and you can't go nowhere. And if you get to say, I only want the positive post on my battery, you, you're, not, you're fixing to go nowhere with God. I'm telling you something. You need the negative and you need the positive. You don't need just negative. That's why I'm going to tell you something. When I come by these kids back here in the back and they're all bunched up stuff, you know what I want to do? You boys tell me what I do. Do I not reach my hand out and say, how are you young men doing today? I want to encourage these kids. I want to tell you, this is the future church. These are the people that's going to be leading for very long. And they don't need a high and mighty aloof preacher who doesn't even speak to them or shake their hand when he comes by. And so it's not all negative. Yes, the Bible has that lot of thou shalt not. That's true, but it's good for you and it'll give you power. So anyway, what happens is this new way, it tolerates evil under the guise of mercy and compassion. It crucifies the truth on the cross of compromise and unity. Now, let's get along. If we have to throw the Bible out, okay, 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 let's just use the NIV. Okay, 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 let's let your, oh, I'm going to say, you say, Reggie, how, how's it go? Uh, I'll, let me show you how it happens. You remember, uh, remember I told you about the youth who visited the other youth church yeah. deal? Yeah. Oh, you know what? Elijah, please forgive me this morning. You're just too handy, okay? Elijah comes back. What he did on the way out was he stopped at the, at the music group's booth, and he bought a tape yeah. or CD. He bought an 8-track. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and he bought, and, he, and, and Sarah, he bought this soundtrack. And you know what you can do with that soundtrack? You can sing with it and have all that boogie-woogie music behind you. And it sounds like you're in the orchestra and everybody, just you and the old cows out there. And so you get that and mom and dad leaves the house and you put that in. They've got that soundtrack and you let her rip. Boy, you're just like them, that group up there on top of that stage that had everybody swinging. And then the next thing comes is, 
You ask Grandma to ask the pastor if you can sing a special next Sunday. Now listen to me. This is one of the most powerful ways Satan ever gets into a church. So granddaughter Sarah, she asked Grandma to ask the pastor. My little Sarah has a special next Sunday. Sarah, you don't act like you want to do this very bad. But <laughs> my granddaughter Sarah has a special next Sunday. Why, that'd be wonderful. And so, Sarah, do you have a special this week? And so here comes Sarah up with her, and they've got the little, and they've got a, they, they've got a boom box up here. And now they plug the boom box in, they take the little CD, and they put the little CD in, and oh, they hit the wrong number. Doggone it. That's a different song. No, that's not the right song. It's number six. <laughs> Y'all try to preach a revival meeting for that going on for 45 minutes. No, that's not it either. That's it, that's it. Now turn it up. But she misses the cue. So they got to back it up and start it over again because she didn't come in just right. How many's ever seen this junk? Raise your hand. It makes me sick. There's something wrong with my spirit about that junk. But it, but it was sister so-and-so's granddaughter that done, sung it, so we're going to act like we like it. And all of a sudden, we've got rock and roll in our church because we're, we ain't got the guts to keep it out. Oh, my land. Let's stand and go home. Y'all understand what apostasy is? I love y'all. Hey, you young people, can I tell you something? Amazing grace will still be good 5,000 years from now. At the cross, at the cross will still be good 10 million years from now. And I don't need uh, James Dean or Elvis Presley or the Beatles. You know when you're getting old, you don't know any of them people that's out there now. Amen.